Hi everybody, welcome to another Isodate DWF repair video. Today we'll see all the work that has been done on this nice Commodore 8032SK. This picture was taken by Mr. Lee, the owner of this computer, when he received the motherboard back in the UK. Of course, I only got this motherboard shipped to me. The motherboard looks in good shape. It has an EEPROM on the character generator socket, probably for a custom or national font. The only other socketed ROM is UD7, the editor ROM, but it's almost out of this picture. The last socketed chip is the 6502 CPU, which is a good thing, should I need to use an open generator or a RAM ROM daughter board during troubleshooting. On every pet, before powering it on for the first time, it is a very good idea to check all rectifiers and transistor junctions. This step is especially important on the universal motherboards, that is, the ones with an integrated CRT controller chip, like this one, where the two bridge rectifiers, CR2 and CR4, usually run very hot when powered on. This is ok, this is ok, it should be double, ok, this is ok too, this is ok, this is missing, this is missing, and this seems ok, so there's something wrong with this uh, bridge rectifier and yes there are missing diodes inside or let's say broken diodes We want 12 volt on pin 8 of any RAM chip. Minus 5 volt on pin 1. And plus 5 volt on any TTL top right pin. So everything looks fine. Now we want to check there is the phase 2 clock on pin 39 of the 6502. And it looks fine. And finally that the reset line on pin 40 starts low at power on, then goes high. Hmm, we we'll just get a black screen. Now, to help me in the troubleshooting process, I decided to use my RAM and ROM dollar board. I have designed and built this dollar board from scratch. In this video description, you can find a link to a video about this board. Now, if I use both the RAM and ROM from the dollar board, the machine starts correctly. This means uh, there are no data bus conflicts and that most of the IO chips are working. If I instead use a test ROM from the other board and switch to the motherboard RAM, it suggests that UA13 is faulty, 
In my experience, this test code is not very reliable, but when there are no bus conflicts, a single faulty DRAM chip indication is usually correct. So, I pulled UI13, checking that I didn't damage any pad or trace, and of course I inspected also the bottom side. Then I tried the pulled chip on my own PET 3032, and indeed it doesn't even start correctly, so the IC was really bad. I have then soldered a socket and put on it a now good 4116 IC. Now the test code suggests A7 address bug, in my experience this indication is just misleading. Basically the test code finds a RAM error when A7 has become equal to 1, but doesn't even try to check if it's indeed a missing or stuck address line, or if some other data RAM chip have an address dependent failure. In the video description down below, I put a link to another universal pet repair where in fact this error was due to another failed 4116 IC. However, in that case I could get a clue from some wrongly displayed characters and identify the bad IC with the current tracer probe. In this case, however, there is no data bus conflict that I could identify as no matter what I try or characters displayed on screen are correct. Of course, I also verified that all the address buffers and address multiplexer are working correctly. So, what are the troubleshooting options at this point? The computer does not yet go to BASIC or to the machine language monitor, so we can't identify a bad RAM chip by writing some quick tests, and pulling random chips it is something I really avoid as much as possible. Then, the other two options left are writing a much better diagnostic code or making some hardware tool that can help me in this kind of troubleshooting. So guess what is the quicker option now? I had this tool in mind since some time, but I couldn't really find a good repair test bed for it until now. The basic idea is to have a 16-pin IC grabber clip that I can put over a dynamic RAM chip. Then, on the test board, there is an identical DRAM chip, of course a good one, that replicates all read and write operations. With a simple XOR gate, I can compare the result of each read operation and generate a logic one whenever the two red bits are not the same. Of course, I want to latch the error signal only when an actual read has been made on the IC on the test. Also, I start latching the error signal only after at least one write access has been done on the IC on the test. That's what the WRS signal does. Only three more logic gates are needed to generate the read and write latching clocks. Also, since 4116, 4164 and 41256 dynamic RAM ICs have a very similar pinout, I bothered a jumper to select on what pin we got the plus 5 volts needed for the test logic. Of course, the reference IC must also be matched with the correct one when testing a given dynamic RAM IC. I've quickly assembled a prototype and just hooked the oscilloscope to the error latch output. Of course, all the needed logic could also be implemented into a cheap CPLD and have even more error display possibilities. But I wanted to first probe my idea and also not take too much time to finish this repair. The test ROM is only testing the lower back of RAM, so I'll try the test tool on all the ICs wired to the CAS0 signal. They are all the odd numbered RAM chips from 5 to 19. Of course, I can skip UA13 that has been previously replaced. The test ROM is continuously running now. When the clip is on a good chip, the oscilloscope just shows a continuous high level since I'm looking at the inverted output error latch. But when we test UA11, 
The error signal shows some periodic low pulses that indicates some read errors as the test code is cycling. However, the error signal gets more interesting when testing UA17. We see a really nice square wave as the test continuously stops on error and probably starts again. After replacing UA17, we now get a more clear indication that also UA11 is faulty. I then replaced also UA11, and indeed the chip I pulled was really bad. And now finally the test ROM shows no errors. At this point I can remove the life support downer board and see what happens. And yes, it boots, but it sees only half of the installed RAM amount. Since now we have the first 16 kilobytes working, I can write some simple basic program to identify the higher bank bad RAM chips. I have just copied some ROM content into the upper 16 kilobytes of RAM. Then I've read back and compared the RAM content and displayed any difference, if any. Since all the differences are either 1 or 128, or these two numbers added or subtracted, I can conclude that the IC connected on the data 0 and data 7 bits must be substituted. The upper bank is made with the RAM chips connected to the CAS1 line. Since we have error difference of 1 and 128, the bad ICs are the ones connected to D7, which is UA4, and D0, which is UA18. So I will first replace UA4 and run the same test again. As expected now, all the differences are either 1 or minus 1, so indeed it's time to replace UA18. This is the fifth failed of 16 total RAM chips on this pad, but remember that I initially found that CR4 bridge rectifier had failed. That one is part of the 12V DC supply that's used also for the 4116 RAM chips. So maybe that failure damaged a few of them. Now finally we have the correct amount of free bytes, so it's time to test all the I.O. ports of this machine. Before testing all the I.O. ports, however, I need to routine both of the tape connectors on this motherboard. They are in a quite bad shape on both sides. I have shown my complete method for retaining the edge connectors on an old video. You can find a link to it in this video description. This is the result after the retaining process. So now I can finally test all the ports.
That's all for this video. I hope it was interesting and useful. If you have any question, please use the comment section below. Have a nice time and thank you for watching.